All right. Good afternoon. And welcome to the uh, machine learning lecture for probabilistic models for classification. Uh, we have a lot to discuss today, so I will uh, try and get to the point as quickly and as much as possible. Um, Today we're going to talk about the role of probability in machine learning and we're going to focus on how to do classification using uh, probability as a tool. Uh, I'm hoping that you've all had some probability or some kind of statistics at some point in the past. We'll go through the basics again, but we'll go through them very quickly. So if you have trouble following along, hopefully I'll hit the important points. Um, but if you have trouble uh, when we go through the basics, if you um, if it um, looks a bit too complicated to you, please have a look at the recommended reading and brush up on your basic probability theory. We don't need that much, but um, it is sort of important to understand these things properly. Uh, so that's what we'll start with. The basics of probability. And then we'll look at a first class of classifiers built on probability, uh, which are the Bayesian classifiers, of which a particular instance which we'll be looking at most and um, about which there is an exam question, is the naive Bayesian classifier, which is a particular type that is uh, especially simple. And the break. Then after the break, we will look at a different type of classifier uh, called logistic regression. Don't let the name fool you. Uh, it's called regression. We'll see later why, but basically it is a classifier. And this is essentially one of these. Um, so uh, two weeks ago on Thursday, we saw this um, least squares loss function for linear classification. And we said, this is kind of a crappy loss function. We'll see some better ones as the course progresses. This is our first one. So we'll see that after the break. And then at the end, we will look at information theory. Which is a um, sort of extension of probability theory which is very useful for uh, doing machine learning with probability. A lot of concepts that we'll talk about in, uh, at that point, a lot of these concepts are going to come back. So they will, might feel a little bit disjointed right now, but as the course progresses, you will see these concepts, especially entropy, cross-entropy, and KL divergence pop up a lot in different settings. So let's uh, dive right in with the definition of probability. What does the word probability mean? Seems like a good place to start. Uh, so as an illustrative example, let's say you read The Guardian and you read this article, one in eight te European teenage boys gamble online. And let's say you have children, so you say to your partner, hey, that means that the probability that our son is gambling online is 12.5%. Uh, to which your partner says, no, that's nonsense. Uh, first of all, I know that our son is not gambling online. Where would he get the credit card? How would he do, do that? And secondly, either he is gambling online or he isn't gambling online. There's no probability about it. Is this true or it isn't true? And then you have a big argument. So the source of that argument, as most arguments, is ambiguity, and it's the ambiguity of the word probability. Uh, it's what you mean by probability that causes the problem here. Uh, and there are two basic definitions of the word, or interpretations of the word. The first is objective probability, of which frequentism is the most uh, common, uh, common approach, for which frequentism is the most common approach, which basically says that a probability is a property of a repeated experiment. Uh, which doesn't necessarily have to be an actual experiment that you actually do. Uh, but the idea here is that you imagine an experiment and the probability of that of something is the uh, proportion of, let's say, successful outcomes, the proportions of 
the proportion of outcomes with a certain event over the total number of experiments you, that you did. So in this case, you might say, we imagine an experiment, we pick a random European teenage boy, and we check if they're gambling, yes or no. And then the proportion, as we do that more and more and more and more, the proportion of yeses we get to the total we sampled will converge to one in eight. Uh, and that's what we mean by saying the probability that a European boy, European teenage boy gambles is one in eight. It's a convergence of this imaginary experiment. And this puts certain constrictions on what we can call probability. So in this setting, uh, our partner was right. We cannot say that the probability that our son is gambling is one in eight, because there's no repeated experiment. We can't ask him over and over and over again and get a different experiment. He either is gambling or he isn't gambling. So we can't have a probability about that because it's fixed. We may not know, but there's a fixed value. There's an alternative interpretation of the word probability called subjective probability of which uh, Bayesianism is the most uh, common proponent, which says that probability is an expression of our uncertainty. It's a personal expression. Uh, note that this encapsulates frequentism, because if we do an experiment, we don't know beforehand what the outcome is going to be, so we are uncertain about the outcome. So we can express that uncertainty in a pro as a probability. But we can also express other things as probability such as the probability that our son is gambling. We don't know, we are uncertain about it, so we can say the probability is one in eight. And of course, in this case, it's our son. So maybe we know a bit more, so we know that he doesn't, definitely doesn't have a credit card. We maybe limit his screen, screen time. So then actually, we can say the probability is much less, even though the probability over all European males, as far as we, well, from this research, clearly, if we pick a random European uh, teenage boy, then the prob our probability, our uncertainty about whether or not they're gambling would be one in eight, but for one specific European teenage boy, namely our son, the probabilities actually could be a lot lower because it expresses our uncertainty, it expresses our belief. And crucially, between us and our partner, the probabilities can differ because it's subjective. So these are very different ways of interpreting the word probability, and they lead to different ways of doing statistics. Primarily the Bayesian approach and the frequentist approach. So then the question is, how, do we, how does this work in machine learning? Uh, practically, we don't really care in machine learning what the interpretation is, because that's about meaning, about semantics, about truth, and we have our own semantics in machine learning which is how well we do on the test set. That's all we care about. Uh, so that's how we define truth, that's how we define performance. A model is as good as it does on the test set, which, strictly speaking, has nothing to do with probability. So we see, I would say, we see machine learning, or sorry, in machine learning, we see probability just as a set of tools, just as a kind of language that can sometimes help us build a good model, sometimes can't. We just use it, and we don't really care that much about what it means or whether the probabilities that we get actually reflect some actual meaning in the real world, be it subjective or objective. In some domains, people do, but in general machine learning, we don't really care that much. It's just sometimes it's a useful tool. So that's the mathematical language of probability theory, which is entirely distinct from how you interpret it. The subjectivists and the objectivists both use the same definition of probability theory, same mathematical language, uh, as do the people in machine learning. Uh, so we'll look uh, through that very quickly, what, uh, what the ingredients are and uh, what they mean. And then we'll look at a, a couple of sort of um, useful functions and concepts that you can build out of those. So it all starts with the sample space, which is basically if you're a frequentist and you're doing experiments, the sample space is the space of all single outcomes. So if you flip a coin, you can have either heads or tails. That's one single outcome, and these are the single mutually exclusive outcomes of your experiment. If you roll a die, it's between one and six. 
If you roll two die, then it's all pairs of numbers between one and six, because each die that you roll has a different outcome. These are all discrete sample spaces, because between uh, two outcomes, there's not a bunch of other outcomes. There's also continuous sample spaces, so if you, for instance, measure the length of somebody, so you pick a random person and measure their length, that's also a sample space. Uh, you usually model that with a real valued number, which means that between any two lengths, there is an infinity of other possible lengths. That's a continuous space versus a discrete space. Uh, and then the basic probability becomes a little bit more difficult, which we won't go into too much, but things like normal distributions are all defined on a continuous sample space. So that's our set of basic outcomes called the sample space. Then there's the event space, which is basically the space of things that have probability. So that's obviously the things in the sample space, like um, uh, flipping a coin and seeing a head that has a probability. But something like rolling a die and seeing an even number also has a probability. So we don't just want to put probabilities on singular outcomes, we also want to put probability on sets of outcomes. So those are the events. Uh, in the case of a discrete sample space, it's very simple. We just take the set of all subsets of the uh, sample space, and that's our event space. That's called the power set of the uh, sample space. If you have a continuous sample space, it gets a little bit more hairy. We won't go into the details here, but if you ever run into this and you need to uh, dig into the proper mathematical definition, just remember, uh, Google the word sigma algebra and that will uh, tell you how to do it. For now, we'll just trust that it works. So that's the event space, the things that we are going to assign probability to. And then there's a random variable, which is a way of uh, describing events, describing uh, uh, things in the event space. The mathematical definition of a random variable is very counterintuitive and uh, technical, so we won't go into that, we'll skip that. But basically you can think of it as a way to describe events. Uh, so we have a probability D, which sort of represents an outcome which takes values. Uh, and using language like this, saying, so D here is the, um, the rolling of, represents the rolling of a die, so it sort of takes the values in our sample space. And then we can describe events like saying, D is even, or D is larger than three, or D is equal to four. So these are all events in our event space, and this random variable notation helps us to describe that. And here we see how this is applied in machine learning. In general, what we do is describe the features of a particular instance as a random variable. So we think of our data set usually as a bunch of independent samples. So let's say we have a data set of people, we randomly sample a person, we sample their height and the distance between the shoulder blades, as we did in the first lecture. Then both of those, for a particular person, would be a separate random var variable. And then if we sample uh, another person, we get a new random variable for the height and a new random variable for the shoulder blades. Uh, the class, of course, is also uh, a random instance, uh, sorry, a random variable, a categorical one in this case. And in some cases, even the model parameters are, can be expressed as a random variable. This is a particularly Bayesian way of doing things, because you have an uncertainty about what the model parameters should be given the data. So you can represent that uncertainty as a probability, and then your model parameters become a random variable. Uh, in frequency settings, this is sort of not done. So that's a random variable. Around that random variable, we write a probability function like this, p, which sort of tells us our probability that comes from somewhere. Uh, we'll go into that, but usually in machine learning, that's your model gives you this probability. Uh, and then there's a lot of shorthand, because if you write things out like this, it gets very uh, complicated. So the long way of writing it out is saying the probability that a particular random variable x uh, has the value zero, like this, and then you put a p around it to show that that's a probability. This expression here on the left, 
px equals zero, uh, evaluates, as it were, to a number. So this here, if we write this, this is a number between zero and one, which is the probability of the random variable taking that value. However, if we replace the zero with a variable, x, just a regular variable this time, then this whole thing becomes a function. Because now, depending on x, the value of this probability changes. For some x, it might be high, some x, it might be low. So now this whole thing is a function of x. So that's sort of good to keep in memory, uh, in mind. Sometimes these things are numbers, sometimes they're values. Uh, so here's an example of uh, a very simple function with just two possible values. Uh, because x can be either 0 or 1, and both have some probability. So I call it a function, but sometimes it can be just very simple like this. And then if we remove this equals sign and we just leave the random variable or we just leave the value, it's a kind of shorthand for this larger, larger version shown up top. And usually the author uh, hopefully has made sure that you can figure out from context exactly what they mean by this, uh, if you're lucky. So that's the basic language of probability. Using that, we can now define some concepts that are going to be useful for us. Uh, and we're going to go quickly through these five concepts. And we'll use a running example of um, two very simple random variables. So we pick, let's say, a random person from the population and we measure their age, we bin it into three categories to make things easy, so they are either young, a teenager, or old, and we look at their teeth, and their teeth are either healthy, unhealthy, or fake. So with these two random variables, we can set out the probabilities, and the most uh, useful distribution you can have, on these, the most useful probability function you can have onto random variables is the joint probabil probability which gives you just the probabilities of all uh, pairs of outcomes. So for every, th uh, every combination of the two uh, spaces, of the two sample spaces essentially, like a young person with healthy, te healthy teeth, we get a probability. In this case, 5 over 18. Uh, because probabilities are numbers between 0 and 1, as I uh, mentioned. So this is the joint probability, which tells you everything you know need to know. And from this you can derive other probabilities. Uh, first up is the marginal probability, which tells you if you're not interested in both random variables, you're just inter interested in one. So here we say, I don't care about the health of the teeth, I just want the probability that somebody's old, regardless of their teeth. All you need to do is sum up the values in one row. You just sum out the uh, probabilities of the teeth, and you come to this value here in the margin, which is why it's called the marginal probability, uh, which is 5 over 18 in this case. So this is called marginalizing out a variable. And the value here gives you the probability of just one of the random variables, because we got rid of the other one by marginalizing it out. Uh, in formulas, that looks like this. So PY, the probability that somebody's young, is the probability that they're young and have healthy teeth, plus young and unhealthy teeth, plus young and fake teeth. And in general terms, you can write it with this kind of sum uh, symbol, this uh, capital sigma. Uh, so have a good look at this, because we'll be seeing this a bit. Uh, this is basically how you will encounter marginalizing out. Then there's conditional probability, which is similar, but not quite the same, um, which asks, what if we know one of the values? So we sample a random person, but we know that their age is young. Uh, so either we've sampled them already, or we specifically sample one of the young people. What can we say then about the health of their teeth? And clearly that changes, because young people are much less likely to have fake teeth. Um, and the way to do that, the way to compute that, the conditional probability, 
is to say, basically what you're saying is given that I'm in this uh, row here, this Y row, what then is the probability of seeing fake teeth? What's the probability of seeing a young person with fake teeth? Uh, and basically what you're doing then is you're taking the value in this cell here, which is 1 over 18, and you divide it by the sum over the whole row. Because everything outside the row doesn't matter anymore, you're just uh, taking this value and you're dividing by, uh, it's not proportional to the whole table, it's proportional to just the values in this row. It's called the pro conditional probability. So here's what that looks like, because remember, uh, so uh, yes, here's what that looks like. So we have the probability of x conditional on y is the uh, joint probability of x and y, which is just a value in the cell, divided by all possible values of x, all possible values, in this case, in the row, summed out. Which, of course, this we can interpret here in the uh, denominator, we can interpret this as marginalizing out x. So this is just the marginal probability on y here below the bar, below the line. So we get this. This is the conditional probability, the joint of x and y over the marginal of y. And if we rearrange this, we get this. And this is a very useful uh, identity. So it's basically just expressing the conditional probability, but rearranging things. And it tells us that the joint can be factorized as the marginal on y times the um, conditional on x given y. So try and sort of imprint this on your eyes as much as possible because this identity is going to come up a lot. Uh, so, in the case of a discrete uh, distribution, that looks like a big table. In the case of a continuous distribution, it might look like this, like these um, uh, multivariate normals that we already saw in the last lecture. Uh, so you have a point cloud, which f uh, forms a multivariate normal distribution, and then if you for instance, marginalize out in one direction, you're sort of projecting onto the axes, which gives you, a, a, again, a normal distribution. It just so happens that if you marginalize a multivariate normal distribution, you get another normal distribution. And taking the joint is effectively like taking a slice through this, uh, through this point cloud along one of the axes. So we saw conditional probability. Uh, oh no, sorry. Oh yeah. Um, so x and y are independent if knowing x doesn't tell us anything about y and vice versa. Which basically means that the uh, joint probability factorizes in two separate probabilities. Or in other words, if you look at this big table of the joint probability, then all these values are just the marginal probability over A times the marginal probability over T. So if, the, if this table follows from the multiplication of the marginal probabilities, then we say that the random variables are independent. So knowing the value of one doesn't tell us anything about the value of the other. Which implies, of course, that the conditional probability of X given Y is the same as the marginal probability of x because knowing y doesn't tell us anything about x. Then there's something else called conditional independence, which is basically the case, uh, a case where we don't know that x and y are independent, usually they're not. There is some factor connecting them, so knowing the value of one tells you something about the value of the other, but that's only through a third variable in this case z. So if we, if we know z, then we can factorize the joint pro conditional joint probability on x and y. So if we know z, then knowing uh, x in addition to that doesn't tell us anything about y. This is a bit uh, abstract, so let me give you an example. Let's say we have two people who both live in a city, Alice and uh, Bob, 
and they live very far apart. Oh, uh, yeah, just a question. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understand. Oh. Yes, so uh, the question is, when is, it, when is the probability distribution continuous? That's when the sample space is continuous, which means that you, uh, if you think of your probability as describing an experiment, the outcome of that experiment is one or more continuous numbers. So in this case, each dot is an outcome of our experiment a sample from this distribution, and it has x, y coordinates, so in this case it's a continuous distribution. Uh, and we'll, we won't go into continuous distributions that much today, but we'll look at the normal distribution in uh, great detail in the next probability lecture. So conditional independence. Uh, we have a big city. Alice and Bob live on separate sides of the city, so they're not very influenced by each other. And uh, we want to know if they, uh, when they go back from work, if they are home in time for dinner. And like I say, they live in separate parts of the city, so uh, different parts of the city have different types of traffic. So we don't, if we know that Alice is late for dinner, we doesn't really tell us anything about whether or not Bob is late for dinner, except very occasionally a monster attacks the city, in which case traffic in the whole city shuts down and everybody's late for dinner. So in that case, if we don't take G into account, if we know uh, only that Alice is late for dinner, in general that doesn't tell us anything about whether Bob is late for dinner, but there's a very small chance that, a, that the reason that Alice is late for dinner is that this monster has attacked the city. And if that's true, then we know actually that Bob is also uh, late for dinner. So knowing that Alice is late for dinner tells us a little bit, gives us a little extra probability that Bob is also late for dinner. So they're not independent. But if we know whether, a whether or not a monster has attacked the city, then they become independent. Once we've sort of excluded that and said, okay, we know Alice is late for dinner, we know that a monster hasn't attacked the city, then we don't know whether or not Bob is late for dinner. It doesn't tell us anything extra, except through this monster connection. So that's how conditional independence works. Uh, and you can write it in various different ways. So here's this factorization approach, and here's a, a different way of writing the same thing. So now that we have this conditional probability, we can say, given some state of the world, what is the probability of observing something? Uh, and that sort of leads to the uh, inversion problem, for which the answer is Bayes' rule. So the inversion problem is that if we have a state of the world, <clears throat> a way we know the world works, or we think the world works, but we have some laws, the way we think the world operates, then given the state of the world, it's usually quite easy to express the probability of all possible outcomes. That's easy to do. We know how to do that. If our model of the world works well, then we have a kind of, if this is the case, then these are the probabilities for our outcomes. But actually what we, uh, and the outcomes is what we call the observables. But actually what we then want to do is look at some observables, and given those observables, work out what the state of the world is. So we want to work it out the other way around. So we have a conditional probability that's easy to compute. Given the state, we know the probability of the observables, and then we want to flip it around. Given the observables, What's the probability over the states of the world? What does the data tell us about the state of the world? So that's the inversion problem, flipping around the conditional. Uh, and you can see that sort of like this. So uh, the, the world, the thing that generates our data, we can think of as a machine in that we know exactly how it works mechanically. And we know exactly what probabilities it generates over the observed data but the machine has certain parameters. So it has certain dials and knobs that we can set to different things, and depending on how we set the dials and knobs, we get different probabilities over the observed da data. And if we know how the, because we understand the machine, if we know how the dials and knobs are set, uh, 
we know the probabilities of the observed data. So we understand the machine, so P data given theta, data given the parameters is known. But then we observe some data. Somebody puts a curtain over the machine. We observe some data. And then we want to know how the dials and knobs of the machine are set. That's sort of basic statistical inference. We're looking for the dials and knobs of the machine given the data. So that's the inversion problem. And the uh, rule that um, Thomas Bayes came up with is for conditional probability is this. So the probability of y given x is equal to the probability of x given y times the marginal on y divided by the marginal on x. It's very easy to prove this if you have a definition of conditional probability. Basically, it looks like this. So we start with the definition of conditional probability, which looks like this. And then we just fill in this identity we saw on slide 22 for the uh, numerator. And there we have Bayes' rule already. So you might think, well, why is Thomas Bayes considered such a genius? Why is he so famous? Uh, if it's such a simple proof from the definition of conditional probability. But basically what he introduced was not so much Bayes' rule, but the definition of conditional probability. So this definition and Bayes' rule are basically the same thing, and he introduced both these things. And they sort of follow from each other. So it's up to you where you start and which you consider the derivation. But that's Bayes' rule. Uh, so there's this, then, there's this uh, fork in the road now where we whether we start talking about Bayesian learning or frequentist learning. Uh, and we won't go into Bayesian learning very much, even though we will talk about Bayesian classifiers. The way we approach the problem is mostly frequentist. Uh, but like I said, the distinction doesn't matter for machine learning people. Uh, so the question is, given some data, which model should we pick? Uh, and the simplest uh, a criterion is called the maximum likelihood criterion, which leads to maximum likelihood estimation, which is simply saying if you have some probability over your data given your parameters, you should pick the parameters, because we're choosing the parameters, we're doing machine learning, you should pick the parameters that maximize this probability, which is also called the likelihood if you express it as a function of the parameters. So we're just maximizing px given data. So this has nothing to do with Bayes' rule or inversion. Uh, that'll come into it later. For now, we just assume we have some likelihood function, px given theta, and we're just going to maximize it. And that's how we fit parameters to data. For instance, if we fit a normal distribution, 1D normal distribution, we get a bunch of numbers sampled from a normal distribution. All we're doing is uh, maximizing the mean and the variance, which are the parameters of our distribution, uh, for this value, the probability of our data given mu and sigma. And because all these samples are independent, we can split it up. So this p over all of these values is just a p uh, over every value multiplied by each other. And we know that that's a normal distribution for which we use this notation. So this optimization problem here, maximizing this likelihood, gives us a good fit. And as it happens, if you solve this, mu becomes the mean and sigma becomes the sample standard deviation or the sample variance, depending on how you parameterize the normal distribution. So that's just an example of how maximum likelihood fitting works. Uh, so that's all the basics of probability I wanted to tell you. Looks like we're going to run into the break a little bit, Let's see how far we get. So the question is now, how do we use this for classification? Uh, a little bit of notation first. So we create a random variable for each instance and each feature of that instance. And we also create a random variable for the class. And we'll stick with binary classification for now. So y is a random variable y for a particular uh, y is a random variable, which takes values positive and negative, uh, and indicates 
the uh, probability over the classes for a particular instance x with these features. So you might see something like this, the probability that y is positive given that the instance is x is 0 0.1 and then the probability that y is negative must be 0 0.9 because the uh, probability space is binary. So now we want to work out this probability, and that gives us a probabilistic classifier, which, given the features, gives us a probability on the classes. Uh, there are two basic approaches to this. The generative approach, the generative classifier, and the discriminative classifier. So the generative classifier, of which logistic regression is an example, we'll see after the break, does this. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm mixing it up. The discriminative classifier, of which logistic regression just take this func takes this function and says, well, it's a function. Machine learning helps us estimate functions. So we'll just learn this function directly. It's a function from the features to the class distribution. So from the features to a number between 0 and 1. So we'll just learn that function directly. That's called the discriminative classifier. But there's also a generative classifier, which says we're interested in py given x. Well, that's the conditional. We know how to flip around the conditional, which is a base rule. And here the uh, denominator is thrown out. This is proportional to, because the denominator is just the uh, probability on x, which doesn't change. So the probability on the classes is proportional to the probability of the features given the class times the what's called the prior probability on the class. And then what a generative classifier does is it takes these two probability distributions and learns both of them from the data. So either we learn py given x directly, or we learn px given y, and we learn py. Uh, and both are, are decent approaches. Uh, so we'll look at Bayesian classifiers as an example of generative classifiers, uh, just to get the uh, the jargon, right, the, the uh, names of these things, there's something called a Bayes optim optimal classifier, which we won't talk about, but it's important not to confuse the things we will talk about with the Bayes optimal classifier. Something what I'll call a Bayes classifier, which is a sort of basic approach, this basic approach of, of generative modeling. <coughs> and then there is the uh, naive Bayes classifier, uh, which is a sort of base classifier plus an additional assumption that uh, makes it work very well on high dimensional data. So I'll start with the base classifier, uh, which is basically saying the class we choose for X, our classifier, is the class that maximizes this probability, the probability of the class given the features. And then we apply Bayes rule to flip around the conditional. And this denominator disappears because we're just maximizing over y. And remember, in the denominator, we just had p of x, which is independent of y. So we can just maximize the, uh, the top part of the division. So we have two uh, functions here. And we can just fit a model to both and then work out which class gives us the highest uh, probability. Uh, so a simple approach for just a plain based classifier would be to uh, separate your points, separate your clouds into uh, your point cloud into the positive points and the negative points fit a distribution, let's say a multivariate normal distribution to all the positive points and a distribution to all the negative points. So those are our conditional probabilities of the uh, features given the class. So given that we're, po there were, that we're a positive point, this is the distribution on those uh, points. So we'll call that M, which could be a, a multivariate normal distribution. And then PY, you can usually just estimate by the relative proportion of 
positives and negatives in the class. So before seeing the features, the probability of a particular class is that proportion of things in the class, uh, in the data set. Uh, and then you can fill in the probabilities or the probability density into this function, and that gives you a classification. So if you do that, for instance, with a point cloud like this, we have negative and positive points, black and blue. You can fit a normal distribution to the black points, fit a normal distribution to the blue points, and then work out. Uh, and in this case, we have about equal numbers of each. So PY is just 0 0.5 blue, 0 0.5 black. And then you can combine these and get a classification. Uh, MVN stands for multivariate normal distribution. <coughs> So that's a base classifier, which works well enough for low dimensional data. But if you have high dimensional data, you, uh, it's, probably quite, it's usually quite expensive to fit a distribution to such a high dimensional point cloud. You need a lot of data. So that's where the naive base classifier comes in, which makes an additional assumption, which is not usually true, but is usually helpful. That's why it's called naive, because we're making an assumption that we know to be untrue, but uh, we know that the resulting classifier is still pretty useful in practice, which is that all the features are independent, conditional on the class. So it's conditional independence. If we know the class, then the probability of feature x1 is entirely independent of feature x2. <clears throat> this is sort of what you do in a linear classifier as well. Uh, so it looks like this, and that means that instead of doing this multivariate normal fitting or fitting any kind of multivariate normal distribution, uh, multi general multivariate distribution, we can just fit univariate distributions to x1 and xy and just multiply the probabilities they give us to get this uh, conditional here. Uh, this is often used with categoric features, so we'll switch from continuous features to categoric features now. And we'll look at an example of spam classification. So here we have a data set. Each uh, instance, each row is an email. And <clears throat> the features are whether the word pill occurs in the data set or the word meeting occurs in the data set. We took pill as a kind of indicator of probably spam and meeting as indicator of probably not spam. And then we gather up a bunch of uh, emails and we get a class column. So from this, we can very easily estimate probabilities by relative frequency. We don't have to fit any normal distribution. We can just say the probability, uh, if we observe that the first feature is T, so there is a word uh, pill in the data set, given that the class is ham, we can just say, well, there are two emails uh, like that in the data set out of six, so the probability we estimate is two over six. So we just estimate by relative frequency. Uh, let me close the door very quickly. And we can estimate the relative frequency in similar ways for all the other uh, probabilities that we're interested in. And the same for the spam classes. And then we can just fill these in. So the probability that we're interested in, the probability of the class, that's what we want to know, we're building a classifier, is proportional to the probability of the features given the class times the probability of the class. Then we apply this naive base assumption, so we split the probability of the features given the class into this product of feature probabilities, and we multiply by the class probability, and that gives us a class probability, or uh, something proportional to the class probability. And that works very well. You can practice that in the homework. Uh, but there's one problem that we need to deal with, which is that sometimes these probabilities become zero. If we estimate them at, uh, as relative frequencies from the data set, here we see that all the spam emails we've encountered have uh, the word pill in them. 
So we don't actually have a good probability for what a good indication for what the probability is for encountering a uh, non uh, sorry a spam email that doesn't have the word pill in it, and the probability isn't exactly zero, it's just because we don't have infinite data that we ended up with an estimate of zero. And the problem here is that if we now work out this product of independent factors, one of them is zero. So no matter how high any of the others are, because one of them is zero, this whole product becomes zero. So as soon as one of your features has a value that you've never seen before, the class becomes zero, uh, which we don't want. We want, uh, even if the, in the case of zero, we want all the other features. So if this particular feature says, well, I don't think this is, uh, this is very likely for this class, one of the other features might say, well, I do think it's very likely, and that should be able to balance each other out. And if there's a zero in there, there's no prob uh, possibility of doing that. So we need to get rid of the zeros. And we do that by smoothing. Uh, so we'll look at the, the simplest way of smoothing, which is called Laplace smoothing. And the easiest way to think of Laplace smoothing is by adding observations to your data set. Basically, what you're doing is for every possible uh, combination of a feature value and a um, class label, you add one pseudo observation to your data set. So we're just adding two emails to our data set, one that doesn't have the word spam and doesn't have the word meeting in it, sorry, that doesn't have the word pill and doesn't have the word meeting in it, and one that has both words in it. Regardless of whatever's in the data set, we always add these two emails. And we do the same for ham. So in total, we add four emails. Note that we don't have to add an FT email and an TF email because the features are independent. So it's enough to just do one email with two Fs and one email with two Ts. Just make sure that for every feature, one of uh, uh, all of the feature values have been observed for every class. And then you never get zeros. That's the basic point, right? Uh, and if you have a small data set, you don't actually count these as proper instances. You sort of weigh them less by a particular value. So you weigh these maybe at 0 0.01 or something. But this is the basic idea of, of Laplace smoothing. You add pseudo observations. I should also say that you don't actually explicitly add these pseudo observations. You just work it into the way you compute the relative frequency. So the unsmoothed uh, probability for seeing a particular value of x1 is the relative frequency, so the frequency of times this occurred times the total frequency for this class. And then by smoothing, basically if you add the if you know you've added these pseudo observations, you know that the frequency of every value you can observe is increased by one because for every value you add one uh, instance. And the total number is increased by V, which is the total number of instances. In this case, T and F, so in this case, V would be two. And then the scaling is also very easy. You just take this plus one and make it plus 0 0.01, and you take this plus V and make it plus 0 0.01 times V. So that's smoothing, which is necessary for most applications of uh, the naive base classifier. So before we go to the break, just a quick summary. We talked about Bayesian first frequencies learning. We talked about lots of probability stuff. And then we ended up with the Bayesian classifier and the naive Bayesian classifier. And we talked a little bit about Laplace smoothing, which is a way to avoid getting zeros in your estimates of the naive Bayesian classifier. So let's have a break here. Uh, we'll take 15 minutes, and then we'll turn and talk about logistic regression. All right, find your seat. Let's get started again. With uh, logistic regression. So we did the Bayesian classifier, we talked about probability. We'll start now with logistic regression. And logistic regression is a uh, 
discriminative classifier. So it's not like a Bayesian classifier we, where we estimate the probability given a class, estimate the probability on the feature space. We just take this probability distribution that we're interested in, what's the probability of our class given the data we've observed, and we learn this directly, we parameterize it directly. And we'll do this on a continuous space. So forget about the emails and the discrete space that we saw before the break. We have some continuous space with continuous features. So X is a vector of continuous valued features. And we'll train basically a linear classifier. So this is a solution to the problem we saw two weeks ago on Thursday where if we plot the accuracy of a classifier, the thing that we're actually interested in, assuming that we are interested in accuracy, if we plot the accuracy over the feature space, uh, sorry, over the um, model space, so we have two parameters, W1 and B, every point in this space is a model, and the coloring indicates how well the model does by accuracy or by error, sorry, so number of misclassified examples, then we see that this space is not smooth, it has a sort of step functions like a staircase. It stays flat and then it jumps up and then it stays flat again. So no search algorithms are going to help us find a solution in this space, find the white bit, because gradient descent, uh, the gradient is zero everywhere, so gradient descent doesn't work and random search doesn't work either. So that's this problem we saw uh, a while ago. So we need to replace this error function that we actually want to minimize with a loss function that gives us a smooth loss surface and hopefully puts the solution in the same space. And the first candidate we saw was the least squares classifier, where you basically just take the points of two classes, the red points and the blue points, and we assign them a number, uh, one for the blue points and minus one for the red points, and then we just treat it like a regression problem. We just fit a line through it. And obviously, obviously, the line doesn't fit very well at all. But it still crosses the plane somewhere, and that becomes our decision boundary. Uh, so that was the least squares classifier, which um, I admitted already doesn't do very well. It's not a very good solution. So now we look at a better solution. And the first thing we do, we want to model this as probabilities. So we, again, assign numbers to our classes but the numbers are 0 and 1 in this case. So we assign 0 to the red class and 1 to the blue class, and we interpret this as probabilities. So this is the probability of a particular instance being blue. So it's 1 for all the blue instances, because we know they're 1. We know they're blue, sorry. And it's 0 for all the red instances, because we know they're 0. And what we're going to do is build a classifier that gives us, outputs a probability that a particular point is blue, uh, which we call positive. So it outputs the probability that the observed class is positive. As you can see, if we just take a plain old linear classifier, that doesn't really work because the output value is very often outside the 0, 1 range. However, we fit the plane unless we make it exactly flat and then it's a constant value, that's also not very helpful. So we add one transformation on top of this linear function to make it fit between 0 and 1. And that transformation is called the logistic sigmoid, which is a very important function that's going to come back a lot, especially if you, uh, when we start doing neural networks and deep learning. And it looks like this. So it basically takes the whole range from minus infinity to positive infinity and squeezes it smoothly into the range between 0 and 1, which is what we're after. Uh, as a formula, formula, it looks like this. 1 over 1 plus e to the power of minus t, where e is this uh, Euler's constant. Uh, there's no real intuition for this. You can also write it like this. If you're into it, you can do a little exercise and, and see if you can rewrite it like this, but if not, just take my word for it. Um, and there's a nice property of the sigmoid function, which is that 1 minus the sigmoid function is the same as uh, the negative of the sigmoid function, which is 
basically saying that because the range is between 0 and 1, flipping it around vertically is the same as flipping it around, uh, sorry, flipping it around horizontally is the same as flipping it around vertically, uh, which you can see from the shape. If you flip it around like this, you get the same shape as if you flip it around like that. And these are the two ways of flipping it around. Uh, and these are interesting properties that we'll use later in a derivation. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize them, but it's, uh, we will use them. So what we do is we take a linear classifier, which, uh, or a linear function, sorry, which outputs a number for a particular instance, and we feed that number through the logistic sigmoid, and we take that as our probability value. So then the line looks like this, it stays nicely between 0 and 1. And here we see the whole classifier. So we have our linear function, the dot product of w and x, plus some bias, fed through the logistic sigmoid, sigma, gives us the output of our classifier, which we take to be the probability that the observed instance is positive. So now we have a classifier, right, which gives us probabilities. Now we need to fit these parameters, w and b, to a particular data set. So we need a loss function. And we will use what's called the logarithmic loss. So before I explain what the logarithmic loss is, some notation. Uh, Q is our data point. Sorry, X is our data point. Q of X is our classifier. So we'll, we're switching here from P to Q to sort of indicate that Q is not the true probability or the probability of the world. It's just the probability that a particular classifier assigns to the data set. So it might be a terrible probability that doesn't fit at all, or it might be a great probability but we'll call it Q instead of P to indicate that it's a best guess. It might be good, it might be terrible. Uh, but otherwise it, it functions the same as this P uh, function, this probability function. Uh, so we'll write the conditional probability of the class given X as Q underscore, uh, uh, yeah, Q uh, sub X C, just to make the notation a little easier. And we know that if the probability of pos is 0 0.1, then the probability of neg should be uh, 0 0.9, because I have to sum to 1. So now the question is, find the classifier Q that maximizes the probability of the true classes. So we use this uh, maximum likelihood objective on the classes. We have a, given x, we have a, a probability over a certain sequence of classes and we want to maximize the probability. We want to find the Q that maximizes the probability over those classes. So we sum over the data set, sorry, we uh, multiply over the data set all the probabilities assigned to the classes by Q. First thing we do to rewrite that is we've put a logarithm in front, which doesn't change the uh, maximum. The arc max is still the same because the logarithm is a uh, function like this. So if you pass something through a logarithm, the maximum stays in the same place. It's a monotonic function. Uh, and uh, logarithms of probabilities are easier to handle, both in symbolic manipulation like we do here and in programming, as we explained in the first homework lecture. Uh, then, because we like loss functions and everything in machine learning is framed in terms of loss functions, we want something to minimize rather than to maximize. So that's easily solved. We just put a minus in front and then it becomes an arg min. So the thing that maximizes, the Q that maximizes this value is the Q that minimizes this value. And then we can work the logarithm out of the, uh, sorry, we can work the product out of the logarithm, it becomes a sum, as we practiced in the first homework. So now our loss function is to find the Q that minimizes the sum of these negative logarithms. And then we can split the data set by class. We know that we have positive and negative classes. So we can break up this sum into a sum over the positive instances and a sum over the negative instances. So then our loss becomes the negative of the sum of the logarithms 
uh, P for the uh, positive instances, the sum over log QP, so the sum over the logarithm of the positive probability, and for the negative instances, the sum over the logarithm of the uh, negative probability. And this is what we want to minimize. So we want to fit this W and B, these parameters of our Q function, we want to fit it to the data by minimizing this value, by finding something that minimizes this value. So we saw the uh, least squares classifier. It has this, we could visualize in terms of these residuals, right? So all of these errors, distances between the actual value and the predicted value are like rubber bands that pull on the line, trying to minimize the, the length of those uh, bars. We can do something similar for the log loss, especially on a sigmoid function. So the probabilities are bars, in this case, pushing up this S, uh, the sigmoid function. And the, um, as you can see, the bars for the positive points push it up and the bars for the negative points push it down because this is the probability of the positive points. So the negative points we wanted to push down, positive points we wanted to push up. And the sum of all these bars, sorry, the sum of the logarithms of all these bars is what we want to maximize. So what we see here, it's a logarithm of the bars. So what we see is that for low values, uh, like here, this is the uh, near the decision boundary, this is the lowest uh, blue bar. That one weighs disproportionately more than the other ones. So it's a bit like these squares. The lower this bar gets, the more it weighs. The more we want to fit this S function, uh, the, yeah, the more say it gets in how this S function should, uh, should behave. Uh, much like with the uh, least squares where the big outliers had the most say in the value of the sum. So that's uh, how this loss function behaves. Now we have a loss function, we have a model. We can work out the gradient, just strap in. This is a tricky one, but uh, it will turn out to be very simple at the end. But it gets a little bit complicated in the middle. So we have our loss here. We want to work out the gradient of the loss with respect to the uh, one of the parameters. So we'll just pick wi, which is one of the values in this uh, w vector. And we want to work out the value of this loss, the derivative of this loss with respect to this uh, wi. So the first thing is we can just work out all these sums. So we get the, uh, uh, the derivative is a big, uh, big sum with a bunch of terms for the positive points in our data and a bunch of terms for the negative points in our data. So we'll work this one out as an example. And the other one follows in a very similar vein. We won't work that out as well. So here we go. Uh, so this now here, top left, is just one of these terms here. So this part is what we're now working out. Uh, so we fill in the definition of our model. Oh, sorry. Fill in the definition of our model, which is the logarithm of this sigmoid of the output of our linear uh, function. We fill in the sigmoid, which is a complicated function. So now it starts to look a little bit complicated. So here we've just filled in the definition of the sigmoid function. And then we simplify because uh, one divided by something is can also be expressed as one to the power of minus one. And an exponent in a logarithm we can take out uh, by putting a minus in front. So here you see that there's a minus out in front of the gradient. That's because we've worked out this one divided by. So far, so good. Now we need to deal with that logarithm, which we do by the chain rule. So we take the derivative of the logarithm over its argument times its argument over our original parameter. Uh, the derivative of the logarithm, you can look this up. It's basically uh, da, 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 1 over the natural logarithm of the base of your logarithm times 
1 over x. So we apply that. So x in this case is this whole thing inside the logarithm. So we apply that on the left here. So we get 1 over ln 2, because we're taking binary logarithms in this case, uh, times 1 over this whole thing. This constant we can ignore, because either we're going to set this equal to 0, in which case the constant doesn't matter, or we're going to do gradient descent, in which times we're just multiplying the gradient with a constant anyway. So to simplify things, we can ignore this uh, this constant here. And then on the right, we've worked out the plus 1, because the plus 1 term doesn't isn't affected by this wi. So then we need to apply the chain rule here again to get rid of this exp. Uh, so we take the derivative of exp over its argument times the derivative of its argument over the original parameter. Well, the derivative of exp famously is the exponential function is itself. The exponential function is the only thing that is its own derivative, so this stay, stays the same. And here what we see is that the minus b term disappears because it doesn't depend on wi. And this is a dot product, so it's a big sum, and the only term that has a derivative, non-zero derivative, is x to i times wi, so that just becomes xi. So the whole thing works out like this. This x here has gone up on top, divided by this 1 plus x wt minus b, multiplied by minus xi, because there's minus here, so we get a minus xi. So we've gotten rid of all the uh, differentiation symbols, so we have a basic function now, so we are done. This is a gradient. We can simplify it a little bit by recognizing that this is one of the forms of the sigmoid function. If you go a few slides back, you can recognize that this is just an expression of the sigmoid. Uh, and the negative of the sigmoid is 1 minus, is the sig uh, one minus the sigmoid. So this is equal to 1 minus the sigmoid wtxb times xi. This sigmoid wtxb is our model. Remember, this is the function we uh, execute to evaluate our model. So we can replace this by our model. And because it's 1 minus our model, our model gives us the probability of being positive. It's 1 minus our model, so this whole thing is the probability of being negative times xi. So I will forgive you if you didn't quite follow along all the way from the top to the bottom. But just notice how simple the derivation is. In the end, the derivative of uh, the logarithm of qxp, the logarithm of the probability of being positive, is just the probability of being negative times xi. So now we can fill this back in to the, uh, the whole loss function. So this term now becomes the thing we worked out. I'm sure you'll believe me when I say that if you do it the other way around for the logarithm, the derivative of the negative examples, you get the opposite. So this is the gradient of our loss function. So it's basically saying if you want to maximize the loss, uh, you look at how much each xi contributes to the uh, negative probability, and you move in that direction. Uh, and if you want to minimize the loss, you move in the opposite direction. And that's log logistic regression. Uh, oh yeah, last year I called this cross-entropy loss. We'll see later why, so there's, I should have changed this slide. We call it logistic loss. Basically, logistic regression is saying, take a linear classifier, take a linear function, sorry, pass it through a logistic sigmoid, take the output as the probability of a positive, uh, of the instance being positive, and then using maximum likelihood fitting, maximize the log uh, probability of that. And that's called logistic regression. Uh, there's no analytical solution, so you can no longer set the gradient equal to zero, but the problem is convex, so gradient descent is guaranteed to find uh, a global optimum. So let's have a look at what that looks like. And we'll use a special data set that shows the problem with um, 
least squares classification. So here's a big data set. And what you see is that all the points are pretty close together, except a bunch of outliers that are blue, that are far away from the ideal decision boundary. And if you apply a least squares classifier to this, what you see is that the, these outliers, they get this uh, square bonus uh, in, in how hard they pull on the decision boundary. So that even though this is beautifully linearly separable, the decision boundary actually just crosses this blue cluster at the, top, at the bottom here. So this is what happens, this is why least squares classifier fails sometimes, because you have these outliers and they pull too hard on the line. Here's what it looks like in one dimension. Basically, if you want an ideal decision boundary, so if you want your decision boundary to be between the two classes, what you see is that the outliers get very disproportionately big uh, residuals. So you will never find this if you use least squares loss. Whereas if you use a sigmoid, there's no problem. The sigmoid can basically fit this beautifully. And as you can see, it doesn't care about these losses at all because these are, get these bars that are very close to, uh, uh, close to one, the size of the bars here on the right. So these don't contribute to the loss at all. So the logistic uh, regression focuses much more on the area near the decision boundary. It draws a decision boundary, and any points near there get a lot of influence. Any point far away from the decision boundary don't get a lot of influence, which you can see if you plot the solution. So this is the solution the logistic uh, regression comes up with, which beautifully separates the two point sets. Uh, and of course, it's a function, so every point in this plane, it doesn't just give you a classification, it actually gives you a probability. Uh, so if you color that, it looks like this. So on this plane, this part, the, uh, the very blue part, the probability of positive is very close to one, and in the very red part, the probability of negative is very close to one, and you see a sort of nice little gradient in between where the decision boundary is, where it's not quite sure. So that's logistic regression that solves our problem with the least squares classifier. So that's a very good method to use. Uh, it has one problem, which is that if your classes are very linearly separable, then your ultimate solution depends a lot, uh, can differ a lot depending on your initialization. So depending on where you start your gradient descent, you might either get this line or this line, which if your test set has one point sort of out here on the on the left. It depends on your initialization whether or not that, that point gets classified as positive or negative. So if you have a lot of points that are far away from your distribution, you get a, a problem. Um, and that's just that's just a drawback of the logistic regression. Uh, so next week we will look at the maximum margin, or uh, next lecture, in fact, on Thursday, we'll look at the maximum margin classifier, which doesn't have this problem. So even if you have this big separation between your uh, two classes, the maximum margin classifier uh, still knows what to do and picks the same solution every time. But we'll look at that on Thursday. Uh, it's also called the SVM loss. So that's logistic regression. Just a little summary before we move to the information theory. Oh yeah, let's uh, mark it off. So we use this logistic sigmoid to provide class probabilities. We use the, uh, there should be a P here, logarithm of P give, of the class given the features uh, as our loss function. Points near the decision boundary get more influence than points far away, which is usually nice. And the least squares classifier has the opposite. And one nice thing is that the log loss generalizes very naturally to multi-class classification, which is not true for the maximum margin classifier. Uh, but we'll see next week how to do this basically, but with a, how to do basically the same thing, but with, a, um, with more than two classes, which can be very helpful. So that's logistic regression. Uh, I think that's the most important thing we talked about today. This is going to come back the most. Uh, so if you want to review something, review this part.
uh, now we move to information theory, which is just nice to know. It's also going to come back a lot, but not, uh, not quite as soon as the logistic regression. Uh, so to calm down from all this mathematics, let's start with a, a simple example. Let's imagine you're traveling and you're bored, but luckily you brought your travel monopoly. So you can play a game of Monopoly. But unfortunately, the dice are missing. They aren't in this picture, but imagine you've lost the dice. Uh, so you have no dice, but you do have a coin, which you can flip to generate an event with probability uh, one half. So the question is, can you use this coin, flip it again and again and again, in some way use the randomness provided by your coin to give you the randomness that you're looking for to play the game? Basically, you want a uniform distribution over the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And you want to generate that uniform distribution using a coin. Can you do that? So simple example. Simpler example is if your coin has, coin has four sides, uh, sorry, your uh, die has four sides. As the D&D &D players in the audience will know, such dies exist. They look like this. Uh, then it's very easy. Right? You have numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. You want a uniform distribution on that. You just flip the coin twice. If it's tails, tails, you call it 1. If it's tails, heads, you call it 2. If it's heads, tails, you call it 3. And if it's heads, heads, you call it 4. And then you can play a game with a four for which you need a four-sided die just by flipping a coin lots of times. It gets a little bit more complicated if you need a uniform distribution over 6. But here's the basic idea. If you... Uh, We'll do uniform distribution over one, two, three first. So you assign those outcomes to the three uh, leaves of this tree. So you get one left over, which is heads, heads. And what you do if you see heads, heads, you just resample. You just start again. Uh, so technically, you could infinitely be uh, flipping the coin for infinity, but basically, you will very, very quickly flip tails. And as soon as you flip tails once, you will be out of this loop and you will have a sample one, two, or three, and all of them are equally likely, so you get a uh, uniform probability. And then you can just flip one more time to turn this into a distribution on the numbers from one to six. So that's how you turn a coin into any probability distribution you like. Uh, for now, let's get rid of these loops. So we don't do loops, and we just do Trees like these, uh, potentially infinitely long trees, but uh, trees with numbers on the leaves, with outcomes on the leaves. And we traverse the tree by flipping a coin. So it's always a binary tree. We traverse the tree by flipping a coin, and that gives us a probability distribution of whatever we've put on the leaves. So you can get different diff probability distributions. For instance, on the natural numbers. So if you draw a tree like this, and you keep it going with the same pattern, then your probability distribution on the natural numbers looks like this. So it's an exponentially decaying distribution. So 1 has probability 1 half, 2 has probability 1 quarter, 3 has probability 1 eighth, and so on and so on. If you rearrange your tree a little bit, so you put more nodes on the same level, your probability distribution looks a bit like this, more sort of heavy tailed and polynomial. And again, it's natural numbers, so we need an infinite tree. Uh, but basically here you can sort of see what kind of distributions you can uh, come up with based on this coin flipping. And these trees have a name, they're called prefix trees. Because if you replace the heads and tails by zero and one, then every leaf in your tree is represented by a binary string of zeros and ones. So uh, E here is represented by the code 110. One, and these codes together, this encoding of this set of outcomes of these six uh, letters, has a unique property that you can, if you want to encode a sequence of these uh, symbols from A to F, you can just stick the codes one after each other. And because no code is the prefix of any other code, 
you can just read out the numbers without the limiter. You don't need to say this is where one code word ends, this is where the next code word begins. You can just stick them next to each other because you can always just follow the tree. And if you hit a leaf, you can decode. So here we get A and start again at the top and decode. So we hit D. And you know that you can decode this whole sequence into its chunks without, um, without requiring delimiter characters. That's why it's called a prefix free code. And that's why it's called a prefix tree. And prefix trees have this property that every prefix tree represents a probability distribution, which we, uh, from which we can just sample by flipping a coin to decide whether we go left or right. So every prefix free code is also a probability distribution. And if we represent the uh, length of the code word for L, uh, sorry, the length of the code word for X by capital L, then we see that the probability that we've uh, assigned, the probability function that we've assigned to X is 2 to the power of minus LX, because uh, the length of L is the length of the path from the root to the leaf. In order to get to that leaf, we have to flip the coin in the right way LX times, so that's one half times one half one times one half for LX times, that's one half to the power of LX, which is 2 to the power of minus LX. So this is the relation between the tree, the code that we have, and the resulting probability distribution. And the other way around, if we start with a probability distribution and somebody tells us this probability distribution can be expressed as a prefix tree, somebody assures us that that's true without giving us the tree, then we know we can invert this function and we know that the code length we get is minus log px. So this is nice because now we have this minus log px that we were talking about earlier that we saw in all these loss functions. It actually has a meaning in terms of code lengths. But it's only true for probability distributions that can be expressed as one of these prefix trees. So a natural question is, which probability distributions can we express this way? Well, it turns out there's an uh, algorithm, there's a bunch of algorithms for translating probability distributions into uh, codes. Uh, and one of the nicest ones is ar arithmetic coding, which tells us that we can do it exactly perfectly, but we can get very close, so close that the difference between minus log px and the closest uh, code we can, assign, we can design for it, uh, the difference is always less than one bit. And we are talking about very large uh, data usually. So if you think about compressing an image, which is uh, maybe a megabyte, then this is a million bits, so one bit doesn't really matter. So usually we just hand wave this away in one way or another, and we equate codes with probability distributions usually saying that there are, we just say we have code lengths in non-integer values. So we can have a code length of 2.5. And we just sort of hand wave that away that if we ever want to practically implement that code, it would have to be three bits. But since we never do that anyway, we can just say code lengths of 2.5 bits. Which tells us that for every probability distribution that we might encounter, there is a code like this. So now, if we sample from this probability distribution and we encode the resulting thing we observe, the resulting element, with this code that corresponds to the probability distribution, what's then our expected code length? Well, that's very easy, so we'll call that function HP. It's a slightly weird function, incidentally, because the argument is also a function. So the argument here is a probability function. Uh, but if you accept that, then we just call that h. And uh, that represents our expected code length if we sample an element x from p. So if we fill in the definition of the uh, expectation, it's just multiplying all the outcomes, multiplying the l times the probability of the outcome. And if we fill in the definition of l, uh, it looks like this. So the minus is worked outside, and here we get the log p. 
usually the binary logarithm if you have uh, if you're thinking of this in terms of codes. And this is the definition of the entropy. So the entropy is the expected code length given this code that corresponds to the uh, corresponds to the data source. And it just so happens, you can prove this, that this is the optimal, this is the code that gives you the lowest expected code length. So the entropy is the lowest possible code, expected code length you can have. There are lots of other codes, but they will give you worse expected code lengths. Uh, and the entropy is a good measure of how spread out your distribution is, or how much you know. So if you don't know anything about what's going to happen when you sample from this distribution, everything is equally likely, that's a uniform distribution, then your entropy is maximal. In this case, two bits, because you have four outcomes, so uniform distribution requires two bits for each. If you know a little bit about what's going to happen, for instance, that A is much more likely than B, and B is much more likely than C and D, what you see is that the entropy goes down. Because you know a little bit about what's going to happen, you need fewer bits on average to encode what has happened. And if your uh, probability is one, so you are certain that A is going to happen, then you don't need any bits to encode that that has happened. So if I'm sending you guys a message, I'm doing this experiment, one of four things is going to happen. If I'm going to send you a message saying what has happened, if this is what we know beforehand, then I will need two bits on average. If we're actually absolutely sure about what's going to happen, then I don't need to send a message at all. That's what entropy means. So entropy is a good measure of how uniform or non-uniform your distribution is. Sometimes we have source of our data. We have a source of our data and we have a model and they might not always agree. Hopefully they do, but not, they don't always agree exactly. Then the cross entropy is a good measure of agreement between two distributions. So Q is the distribution that we fit to a data, to the data which corresponds to a code, but not the optimal code because it's, Q isn't the same as P. And P would give us the optimal code. Then we can look at the expectation under the source of our data of the code length that Q gives us. Uh, and the lower that is, the better Q is. So you just fill it in and it looks like this. That's called the cross entropy. And if Q is equal to P, then the cross entropy is minimal. And then we found the optimal expected code length, which is not zero. It's equal to the entropy of P. So if you want something that's zero when we found the optimum, sometimes that's nice. We just need to subtract the entropy of P. So we take the cross entropy, we subtract the entropy of P. And that thing is then zero if Q is equal to P, which is sometimes nice mathematically. That's called the kullback leibler divergence, KL divergence. And you can write it like this if you want. So if you see something like this, you can also recognize that it's just cross entropy minus entropy of P. Um, so these are terms that are very useful in dealing with probability distributions and in understanding probability distributions. And we've actually sort of encountered one of them already in the log loss. So if we have two distributions, H and Q, both over the binary space positive negative, so simple distributions, and we can write out this cross entropy over our entire data set, it looks like this. So this is just this sum of our cross entropy uh, worked out, where Px, so that it's now the cross entropy between Px and Qx, Px is what our data tells us, Px is the truth, and Qx is our model's approximation of the truth. And we know that in a classification data set, we, don't, we actually know for sure what the labels are. So this is either one or zero, and this is either one or zero. So one of these terms becomes one, one of them becomes zero and disappears. So we can split this sum up into our positive and our negative examples. And in the positive examples, only this remains. And in the negative examples, only this remains. So what we see here is that the cross entropy, uh, if we optimize for cross entropy over a data set where all the labels are certain, we actually end up with this log loss, this maximum likelihood log loss. So cross entropy loss and maximum likelihood log loss are the same thing. 
which is important because in most frameworks, most libraries, it's called cross-entropy loss, this log loss that you use for logistic regression. So that's why. Summary site information theory. We can equate probability distributions with codes. This is a very helpful perspective. It gives us the entropy HP, which is a good measure of the uniformity of P. It gives us the cross entropy and the callback livelihood, which is a good measure of distance between two functions. Uh, it's gonna come up a couple more times. It's good to be familiar with these things. Here's a little slide to stare at if you feel lost and you want to see what we actually talked about for the last two hours. And that's all I had for you. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'll see you on Thursday when we'll talk about neural networks and support vector machines. <laughs>